Michael Reed, Senior Editor of The Economist, thank you for being here. Thank you very much for inviting me. Morning, Jensen. Mr. Reed, it seemed like a little over a year ago Latin America was the light that shone in the world's economy. Uh, Brazil was uh, getting ready to host the World Cup. It was an economic powerhouse. Mexico had just, the new president, announced very aggressive reforms uh, to the country's telecommunications center, sector, education, energy, um, and the country was full of optimism. It, natural resources prices were very high, yet the situation now seems a lot gloomier. In Brazil, there's an economic crisis and a lot of political fatigue. In Mexico, there's a political crisis and the uh, violence has reared its ugly head once again. The price of copper and the price of oil have dropped. What does the second half of the decade look for the region? Look like for the region? It looks far more challenging than the last few years. No, I mean uh, the the golden years of, um, of rapid economic growth um, induced. Um, largely by the commodity boom uh, are over. Um, so the challenge for the region is how to grow on the basis of productivity, being more efficient, more productive, more competitive, etc. And that requires structural reform. Now, I think some of those that uh, President Peña Nieto have, uh, have done, has done in Mexico are in the right direction and are important. But clearly there is a second problem in the region, which is that of violent crime, um, uh, which is um, not getting any better. Um, and um, the problem in, in Mexico is that, is that the president seems much less assured in dealing with that than in dealing with the economy. In the, there's an economic slowdown all over the world, China, Japan, and Europe, and so many international investors were looking at Latin America, and when they study Latin America, tend to look at the two uh, largest engines of growth, uh, Brazil and Mexico. As these problems uh, each country is facing, come to the surface, do you think investors are going to stop uh, putting their money into the rest of the region? Well, I think Brazil has disappointed for the last, uh, last few years. Um, uh, and it's true that the, the world economy as a whole has been growing more slowly, but Brazil is, under Dilma Rousseff has grown much less than the regional average the, in, in Latin America. And that's, I think, mainly because of policy mistakes. I mean, she managed to confuse and scare off private investment. And Brazil cannot grow uh, faster uh, with um, investment levels being so low. So, um, I mean, the good thing is that um, uh, many economies in the region, not all of them, but many of them, are in a much more solid fundamental position than they were in the past. A lot of the financial fragilities have been overcome. So you're now seeing currencies devalue in an orderly fashion, which is what needs to happen. Um, yes, um, authorities need to, need to be um, attentive to inflation, but, um, but you're not seeing the kind of panic that um, there was in the, in the early 80s or in the late 90s. Uh, and so that's a good sign. But the region, I repeat, the region to go back to growth needs to address the productivity issue, which is complicated but essential. Thank you. Now that the oil prices are down, what's <coughs> going to happen with President Maduro in Venezuela? Well, I, that's a very good question. I mean, I think uh, there's no doubt that his position is weakening um, by the week. Uh, um, uh, he, unlike Hugo Chavez, he is not the undisputed leader of the revolution. He looks more and more like um, the head of a divided coalition um, uh, of different factions. Uh, he doesn't appear to have the authority or the desire to take the, the tough decisions that are needed um, uh, to get the Venezuelan economy back to stability and growth. What we're about to see is what Hugo Chavez would have looked like if he hadn't had the massive oil windfall that he had. I mean, in, in his 13 years in office, um, Venezuela's oil, oil income was three and a half times more than it had been in the previous 13 years, not because production increased, but because prices went up. Well, prices are coming down now. And finally, are you optimistic with respect to the peace process with the FARC in, in Colombia? Well, it faces a, uh, the FARC faces a moment of truth uh, uh, right now uh, with this kidnapping of uh, this army general. Unless they release him unconditionally and pretty swiftly, I think their credibility as a, as, a, uh, as a peace negotiator or as a party that wants peace will be put in doubt by Colombian society. If they do that, then I am reasonably optimistic that in the end there will be a deal. I do, I do think the longer it goes on, the more difficult it is. Uh, I do think that the deal will not satisfy everybody in Colombia. That is in the nature of these conflicts. The important thing is that 
the balance between justice and peace, um, Colombians are the only people who, who, who know how to strike that, who, who, who can decide exactly how to strike that. And so it's very important that they do have the chance to, to express their view on this um, when there is a deal. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much.